Hey there, it's Olivia Spanner here from Olivia Catastrophe and today I'm here to talk to you about some books that I have recently read. I'll have content warnings for all of these books in the description box down below in case that is something that you need. But without further delay, let's get right down to the books. So the first book that I want to talk about is I Wish You All the Best by Mason Diva. This is a young adult contemporary book where we are following our main character, Ben, and they come out as non-binary to their parents, but when they do so, their parents kick them out and they have nowhere to go, and it's about what they do in this situation. Now, as you can tell from that synopsis, this is quite an emotional book and quite an emotionally intense book. And I think it's good to have books like this because I've read so many books that are full of queer joy and queer pride lately, which is all really good and we do need to see those books and they do need to be out there for teenagers. But also I think it's equally good to have books that talk about when you're not accepted and what you can do in those situations and where do you go next? Because even though this book is dealing with such intense subject matter and it starts in a very hurtful and sad and disappointing place there is still a lot of hope threaded through this book and I quite liked that there is. Ben is a really nice main character to follow they're really working on their own path and journey with coming out especially this fear that they hold within themselves to come out again to new people after the experience that they've had being so negative and you just see them slowly start to blossom and grow in a very quiet and discreet way that's really really nice. They do some things which have been really nice to see be part of this story such as going to therapy and trying out medication for different things that they are diagnosed with and I appreciated that you got such positive therapy representation and also medical and med taking representation for teenagers as well. I think that was really important. There's a whole storyline with their sister that they've not spoken to in over 10 years and kind of how they start to find their way back towards each other once again and as well as that there is a romance going on. Ultimately I do think this is quite a quiet book, there's not a big plot reveal, there's not a big plot twist, it's about character development and a lot of this is also about identity because Ben has had to suppress a lot of their identity for a very long time as they weren't out and then has such a negative stamp on the experience of trying to blossom into that identity that they've really got to start from the ground up all over again and there are some things in this that reviewers have mentioned just seem a little bit imperfect with the way that Ben talks about the queer community as a whole but I also like to give it the grace of the fact that Ben is still working things out, Ben is still figuring out where they fall within their sexuality and their romantic preferences and their understanding of the queer community and they've not really been part of the queer community before they're just starting to identify that way and just starting to find their way into it so I do give this book the grace of the fact that the main character also doesn't know exactly what they're doing and therefore not all of the statements that they make are going to be correct but I also don't think all of the statements in this are presented to be correct I think it's very much presented as this is Ben's take in this current moment but it's not like the live end all and be all of what it means to be part of the queer community. So that's how I feel on that matter but I did really like this story. I like the relationship between Nathan and Ben. There was a lot of no push, it was very gentle, it was easy going and when they reached moments where they just couldn't progress further for whatever reason they took the moments that they needed to fall back into friendship and I found that really nice and lovely. I do think things were rushed a bit at the end in terms of them getting to where they did romantically. The ending happened quite quickly and I would have liked to see that spread over a bit more because while I very much believed in their friendship I didn't quite believe into the way they fell into a romantic relationship to the depth that they fall into that romantic relationship that quickly and I think that could have taken more time but overall this was a really nice story a really lovely one and I ultimately do think it's also a very very important one and I learned things from reading this but I also just think it was a good journey to be on and it moved me. I then read Tokyo Ghoul Volume 4 by Sue Ishida. This is the fourth book in a series so I can't tell you that much about this one in particular in terms of synopsis but we are following Kaneki who is half ghoul half human and he is manufactured into being half ghoul and there is no other half ghoul half human like him. He is one of a kind so he's kind of figuring out where he belongs between these two worlds that do not get along with each other at all seeing as ghouls eat humans 
and also reckoning with the part of himself that also wants to eat humans even though he really doesn't want to do that. So that's what the series as a whole is about but in this one in particular, we get to meet a character called Sukiyama and it's the gourmet narrative. And Sukiyama is one of the characters that I personally love. He's not depicted in a positive light and I really like him as an antagonistic character, question mark, if that's how you want to describe him. He's so unique and he's so flamboyant and eccentric and also just very... Like, Sukiyama is one of a kind, and I love him for that. I love him for breaking all of the rules and doing things his own way, but I do think reading the manga is quite interesting because I've already watched the anime, and you can see him on the cover, actually. He's so brought to 3D and brought to life by the colours in his outfits and his choice in fashion wear and that didn't quite translate in the manga because of the fact that it is in black and white and having seen it in colour originally in the anime it did like have an effect on me the fact that he wasn't as flamboyant as I know him to be because he's in black and white here but you still get to see a lot of his eccentricity in his character and ultimately I really like the gourmet storyline it's absolutely a petrifying situation to be in and ironically it was given me Volturi Twilight vibes and I love that for me. I love that fandom crossover and comparison So I had a lot of fun with that so much of the tension and their energy that is created towards the end and the crescendo of the ending of this volume comes from how is he gonna get himself out of this situation, but ultimately Does he really manage to do it himself? Hmm but other than that, I did have a good time with this. In the beginning, you get to hear a lot more about some certain characters' backstories, and I really loved that. I loved imagining what it would have been like back then, but also it's furthering the development of like who Kaneki is, why he is so important. And in terms of some of the secondary characters that he interacts with, it's building relationships that will become important and vital later, but it just shows how caring and loving Kaneki is, and how he is fully able to remove his own thoughts and feelings on situations to do the best by the people that need him around and I love that. I love Kaneki. He is the sweetest. I also read Poems by Len Penny. This is a poetry collection and actually I read this twice. I read it first physically and then I reread it in audio. So Len Penny is a well-known TikToker and she reads and writes poetry in English but also in Scots. So she is a big champion for Scots language and the Scots culture and she performs poems on her TikTok. So and her Instagram reels if that's more your platform and so I've seen her in different events before and I just know that she is such a fantastic spoken word poet so I needed to hear the audiobook which is narrated by her and hear her performing these poems and I have to say my favourite experience of reading this one was when I was reading along to the audiobook so I highly recommend getting the book and reading along that way and these poems were they were so charged. If you listen to Len Penny talking about them or reading them out to you, you can feel her emotion in every single one of these poems. They are about misogyny. They are about abuse. They are about feminism and they also are about love in different forms and ways and I loved I loved how it really was just making a stand against some of the misogyny that is imbued into society and how it was like a feminist foot forward in this poetry collection and I think a matchstick that's on the cover is the perfect representation of this book because it feels like anger and lighting the fire under all of that rage and charging it into these words and I, l I just fantastic fantastic poetry a really good collection and I don't speak Scots but you can still clearly understand what the Scots poems are about and it just adds another layer and tone to them for it to have that cultural overtone to the word so highly highly recommend this this was a very good poetry collection I read New Animal by Ella Baxter this is the proof copy and this is what the finished cover looks like so this is a literary fiction book and it's set in Australia it's by an Australian author and in this one you're following our main character who is the person who does makeup on the dead in a funeral parlour for their ceremonies and she is someone who believes she knows everything about grief because she is working in this industry. However, when someone close to her in her immediate family passes away, she realises that she doesn't really know that much about it and she finds herself falling and tumbling into physical connections with people to try and escape her own mind and her own grief and this also leads her onto the BDSM scene. There was something quite 
magnetic about the writing style. I did just keep reading and keep reading and keep reading. And I loved that this book was set in Australia. It's just so refreshing and so nice to be in a country that's not the US or the UK in books, but is still English speaking within the narrative. And I found that representation of the location and the weather just so lovely and pleasant to be in, especially as I miss Australia myself. So that was nice to read. And I related to this book a lot as someone who has recently gone through a grieving period themselves because I am someone who has studied and looked at and read around grief and I know a lot of things about grief and then there comes this kind of duality to when you are actually grieving yourself because you know the stages that you're going through you can identify what you're doing and you know the things that you can do to help yourself through them but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to experience grief less or you're going to be able to navigate your grief better. I think grief is one of those things where regardless of how much you know about it you will always still be unprepared for how much it hits you and this book shows that duality and depiction really really well and I completely understood and connected with the main character's really confused feelings on how she was dealing or her lack of dealing with her grief. That was all very, very good and well done. What I didn't like about this book was the way that it did throw in the physical relationships aspect to it and the BDSM scene in particular. So a lot of people have talked about how when she goes into the BDSM scene in this one to kind of escape her mind, she's not coming from a healthy place, she is unprepared and she's doing it for all of the wrong reasons. And that's why her experience with it is so bad. I fully 100% agree with that. But even then, beyond that, the way that it shows the processes of entering into the BDSM scene are so wrong and are so inaccurate. She is given training which is walking around a room and then shown what things are and then is thrown right into a scene. No system establishment is going to do that, that's so inaccurate. You would never show someone around a firefighter building and then be like now you can go and save fires. There's so much more that needs to be done before you get to that step and so the blasé way that that was described as the correct procedures and shown to be the correct procedures in this book was all wrong for me and yes she has some negative BDSM experiences which could happen if you walk into the situations in the way that she did. Sure, I can't argue with that depiction but everything else about the depiction of BDSM really rubbed me up the wrong way especially as I've been reading books that do that aspect of the story much much better and also the fact that this is going to be the one that most people see because it's literary fiction and it's not romance so that really than me and really impacted my enjoyment of the book because it was just it was handled so wrong for something that's already depicted so poorly in contemporary society so that annoyed me to no end and so in the end I ended up feeling quite mixed about this book because it had some positives to it but it also had some negatives to it as well. I then read Not So Pure and Simple by Lamar Giles. This is a young adult contemporary book I've been meaning to get to for a very very long time and I had such a fantastic time in this book. I really really enjoyed it. In this one we're following, what's his name? Del. We're following Del and Del has had a crush on Kira for a very very long time and so he goes to Kira's church and when he sees her signing up for something at the front he decides to sign up for it as well but what he doesn't know is that he has signed up for a purity pledge which means they won't be sleeping with anyone because that's what God has ordained for them and it's the right thing to do. At the same time sex ed is being introduced into his year group and as well as that there's a lot of fuss around these baby getters who are a group of teenagers who all got pregnant at the same time last year returning to school. And the main theme of this book is toxic masculinity. Oh my goodness does it handle the theme of toxic masculinity so well. It examines the culture and the stereotypes and the mannerisms that lead to festering toxic masculinity within schools and within the ways that boys are taught but while it's doing this for the teenage audience it's also critically examining the actions of the adults that are depicted in this book so it's not just the school it's not just the teenagers it's also the adults who are getting examined in terms of this commentary on misogyny and toxic masculinity festering within contemporary society and it's also critiquing sex ed and the good thing is about sex ed and the ways in which sex ed is incomplete and not perfect and still needs to be improved and handled better within schools. So it's commenting on all of that and digging into all of that but at the same time 
there's the purity pledge element to this book and it's talking about the ways in which the church has power plays within it that are not necessarily always good and how purity pledges also may be very very toxic and public purity pledging is not an ideal thing to be doing either. And so it's examining the church through the critical lens, the school system through the critical lens and toxic masculinity through a critical lens and it balances all of those elements perfectly. Just round of this applause for this book to be able to handle all of those themes in a very detailed, in a very realistic and a very, very important way. I appreciated all of that. It does take the time to unpack some of the stereotypes that we have around teen pregnancy as well. And ultimately, I felt really touched by this book because I felt very seen. I haven't read or as a teenager, I never read a book with a depiction of what it is like to be a black teen who believes in God during the school years. I, I've never read that depiction before. And so getting to see kind of black Christian culture in a book, it struck true. It really struck true to me and I didn't know that I needed to read it until I read it. And as well as that, I appreciated that it was including that culture and the positives of the church community while taking the time to be critical and examine the not so good points about some of the church cultures and communities that we've built. It wasn't turning anything into a negative light per se, but it wasn't saying this is the perfect ideal thing. And while it is only side characters, there are some queer Christian characters in this as well. And that always restores my, my heart because it aligns with my own values and beliefs and so getting to see that within a book that has Christian themes into it was really really good. Del is a flawed character and I just appreciated seeing his journey throughout this book so very much because he's by no means the perfect teenage boy. He is doing his best to make the environment around him better for everyone that he cares about while simultaneously, continuously failing to see how he is also part of the problem and he has to have that epiphany and that breakthrough moment and he's going through a lot of unlearning, he's going through a lot of reevaluating, and he is making the right changes but it takes him a while to kind of clock onto the ways in which he needs to change most intrinsically and I appreciated getting to be on that journey with him and to go and see it with him. All of the secondary characters were done really really well but ultimately it's teenagers being messy and that's one of my favourite things to see in young adult because I know that I would have acted this way as a teenager in some degree and other teenagers that I knew were acting that way too. So it shows teenagers as they truly are, as messy as they truly are. They're all going through puberty, they've all got things going on with their bodies and sometimes the situations that they end up in may me laugh so much but I never felt frustrated by the characters. I always understood the choices that they were making and why they were doing them. I love it when we get to see adults being humble because even though there are adults involved in this, they're at school, he's got two parents who are looking after him. The parents also have to own up and admit when they are wrong and be humble and listen to their children and I think that's such a good thing, a depiction for teenagers to see that sometimes parents are imperfect and sometimes you can be right too and parents have to own up to when that happens but also there are points where the parents stamp their foot down and they are absolutely in the right to do that and so I was really happy with the parental depiction in this, the themes, the characters, it was such a good story. It ended in a very satisfying place. Another one I highly, highly recommend. I also read a picture book this month. So I read Sulwe by Lupita Nyong'o and this is illustrated by Vashti Harrison. And this one is about Sulwe. She is born dark, dark, dark skinned. And the rest of the members of her family are more so light skinned. And so she spends her time wishing to be light skinned like the rest of her family. And she has to learn how to appreciate and find the beauty within her skin tone. This was a really beautiful picture book. I really, really liked it. I think the illustrations in this are absolute works of art. I just felt like when I was reading this, I have to show it to you. When I was reading this, I thought, oh my goodness, I could put these up on the wall and frame them because they are that beautiful. Come on, that just, beauty, beauty in a picture book. So Vashti Harrison did a phenomenal job with the artwork, A plus to you Vashti, because you knocked it out of the park. But also the story itself was a really beautiful one of self-acceptance and finding the beauty within yourself. And it's just a story that so many children can value from and 
take a good message from. I wish graphic, I wish this picture book existed when I was younger and it's one that I can see myself recommending to a lot of parents and teachers and everyone. I do think at some point, and I had a discussion with, about this with someone on Instagram, there are some words used in this which used to be slurs and are not particularly seen as slurs by this current generation, but it could have so easily been excluded from the book and didn't need to be there. And I think if it wasn't Lupita Nyong'o writing this book, maybe the picture book artist maybe the author would have glossed over those particular words. So hmm, I, I think personally, if I was reading this with a child and they weren't at reading age, I would skim over those words and just rephrase that sentence so I wouldn't need to say them. And I can understand why some people would be uncomfortable saying them. I'm not giving you a solution to this because I don't think it's the end of the world for those words to be in there, but I wouldn't particularly have chosen to put them in there myself if that makes any sense but I don't think it takes the value away from this picture book it's still one I highly recommend and I really think a lot of children would take value from so don't not read this with kids because of that and then as we always seem to do lately in these videos I'm going to end with talking about a series of Sarah Simone books that I read and it's not all sunshine and roses this time. I had a very up and down journey reading this series. So it starts with The Awakening of Ivy Leibold by Sarah Simone. And this one is following Ivy. She has become a spinster essentially. Her brother has died. She has no prospects. And so she has no family as well. And she gets sent to live with her cousin's widowed husband. And so she's there and they're both going through their grieving period because it was fairly recently when she learns that there are mysterious circumstances around her cousin's death and it looks like she may have been murdered. The husband that is widowed that she's been sent to stay with may have been the one to do it, they just couldn't pin enough evidence on him so maybe he might be the murderer and then they start a romantic relationship which is uh, quite BDSM heavy <laughs> and very very steamy. And all through this, she is kind of like, is he the murderer? Is he not? She's trying to do digging into it and she doesn't want to give her heart to him because she's worried that he might be the one who killed her cousin and could kill her. What are the grounds for a romantic relationship? I have no idea, but I actually did enjoy this book. I do think it had flaws to it, mostly. Markham as a character felt very cartoonish in the way that he was like, oh, I'm so bad, I must keep myself away from her, I've got these dark urges. It just seemed a bit cartoonish, a bit too on the ridiculous end. I wasn't convinced of their romantic connection. It seemed very, very reliant on their physical relationship and that's just not it for me. I need to see how characters fit emotionally and Sarah Simone is usually very good at balancing this, but in this one she didn't, she didn't quite manage to hit the mark, so I was just like, hmm, but the murder mystery was intriguing, so I actually did like it in the end because of the murder mystery elements. And so I ended up feeling good about this book and positive, and I was happy to continue on to the second book in the series, which is called The Education of Ivy Leafold. And this one I did not like at all. So in the beginning with the first one, I was giving credit to this main character who was really, really worried about the fact that she might end up with a murderer. And that kind of, like slowed her down but in this one she just keeps on going with him and takes their relationship to new levels and new heights and all the time she's worried about the fact that he's gonna kill her and I'm just like you're not Bella Swan like no bedroom time is that good that you need to risk dying if you're not sure he's innocent put it on pause figure out who committed the murder and revisit it later if there is a later like honestly the the bedtime times are not worth dying for. So I was frustrated by our characters' choices. I didn't understand where they were coming from. I have to admit, the steamy scenes in this were really good. <laughs> like the steamy scenes were so good. And I forgot to mention, there's a steamy scene in the first one that is very, very good as well. And these steamy scenes kind of involve more than one person. So you kind of have to be behind that and also public scenarios so you need to be behind that but the steamy scenes in this series 
they're very very good so that's not the problem the values in this were the problem also I think there are certain discussions and promises that should not be made during the process of trying to seduce someone because then they're not fully thinking with their full brain and so that's not consenting to me and in this one there are some decisions that are made under the haze of seduction and I did not like that it didn't feel consent friendly I also think the ending of this book was utterly ridiculous for a moment there I thought the main character had a backbone and was sticking by her principles and values and then she ruined that completely and I was like oh my goodness this is ridiculous like why are you even doing what you're doing your choices are going to eradicate that decision so quickly so that frustrated me I couldn't connect with their relationship again it was just all driven by sex this book was a mess it was a mess a mess a mess and I did not like it at all but I'm a fool for Sarah Sloan so I went on and read the third book in the series <laughs> and I read The Punishment of Ivy Leavold and this ending was okay it satisfied me so I liked it more than the second book but I didn't like it as much as the first book largely this has to do with the murder mystery element I figured out who the murderer was quite easily and also the way that this book starts really throws it in your face who the murderer is so then it's just a matter of how did the main characters not cotton on to this quicker and so while it ended with a lot of dramatics and it did focus on finishing up and raveling up the plot it was just a little too late because I'd seen everything coming and so the drama kind of went over my head the steamy scenes in this were really good though <laughs> the steamy scenes in this were really good though and so that also redeemed the book quite a bit for me because I really liked these steamy scenes and I also think Markham as a character improved himself in this this book I say that with a with narrowed eyes because of the fact that what's revealed at the end of the second book made me strongly dislike his character there was also a lot of misogyny to his choices at the end of the second book and I still can't see how he has improved like I can't see how I can't see past the misogyny that he left behind in the first in the second book and I can't see past the despicable choices that he made in the second book I do think it's important to forgive yourself for your past mistakes but I just didn't I couldn't ship them as a couple given what I figured out about him but ultimately I just didn't like him as a love interest and I didn't root for their relationship so while the steamy scenes were very very good and the mystery satisfying I just I wasn't a big fan of this series However, the last book I'm going to talk to you about today is The Reclaiming of Ivy Leavold and this is actually a novella that is included in The Punishment of Ivy Leavold but I wanted to separate it in this review even though it's not separated on Goodreads because my thoughts on this book are so drastically different from my thoughts on the rest of the series and that's because I really really liked this novella. Now I think what I liked about this novella is because you can also read it as a standalone quite detached from the rest of the trilogy even though we're following the same characters but the focus in this is so significantly shifted because we are in the future and it's after Ivy has had a baby and she's postpartum and she's feeling no sexual desire whatsoever and it's really put a bit of a crank in their relationship maybe because most of their relationship was built on sexual desire but Yes, it's put a, a spanner in the works and it's talking about your emotions and your feelings and bedroom times after having a baby. And I don't think a lot of books talk about that. And even in the the one, the very, yeah, the singular steamy scene that we get in this, her body is quite different and that impacts the stuff that they end up doing in the steamy scene. And I quite liked that. I quite liked that I got to see something steamy about someone who's more recently had a baby I just haven't read that before at all like nothing delves into that so it was really really refreshing to read that and I think really interesting and insightful and actually if we are going to have these steamy romance books why can't we have them about new mums and what it's like as well as that what I really appreciated about this one is it showed Markham to be really caring and attuned to what she needed and in a very loving light and I appreciated that because I feel like we hadn't seen that in the original series and then the last thing that I'll mention that I really liked was the BDSM aspect to this so I've read BDSM in many different depictions forms and ways because there is no one way to do BDSM it's not all chains and whips excite me <laughs> to quote Rihanna but this showed how BDSM can really be about care and how care 
can be tied to command because I am interested in stories around motherhood and I think the intersection between physical intimacy and motherhood postpartum is one that is a whole area where we can have a lot more books in so if you've got any recommendations do send them my way but I really enjoyed that Sarah Simone book and I actually think going through the roller coaster of that whole trilogy was worth it to get to that end novella so Please let me know in the comment section down below what is a book that you have recently read and enjoyed or recently read and had conflicting feelings about. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit that subscribe button if you want to see more and don't forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video and you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!